Welcome, everybody. This is Dr. Greg Eckel on What the Health. And my esteemed guest and colleague is Dr. Ken Charlin. He's an MD, PhD, IFMCP, is board certified neurologist, consultant, functional medicine practitioner, assistant of clinical, assistant clinical professor, researcher, author, and speaker. Woo! Welcome aboard, Dr. Charlin. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dr. Greg. Glad to join you guys. I love uh, I love our conversations. You know, I've got you on the upcoming Brain Degeneration Summit, and I want to share that with the folks of what the health as well. We're going to do a little bit bigger, deeper dive. You have this focus on neurology. Um, you've got a book out too that I wanted to mention. That is the author of the number one bestseller, The Healthy Brain Toolbox. It's a neurologist proven strategies to improve memory loss and protect your aging brain. You know, this is a topic near and dear to me. I love talking about different facets of brain health. And in particular, we picked a doozy of a topic today, which is an integrative approach to ALS. Yes, very important. And I wanted to talk to you because this one is really, I mean, I was talking uh, to my partner over lunch just saying, you know, about ALS and, you know, it's a, it's a tough diagnosis to get, yeah? Um, it's a tough diagnosis to treat. And a lot of times there's a lot of overwhelm and just pure depression, right? Because it's a death sentence at this moment in time for a lot of folks. Now, we know that's not the case. Like we've, I think there's been over 43 documented cases of people that were clinically diagnosed and now no longer have evidence of disease. Right. And I want to talk to you about your approach, this functional integrative medicine approach. And overall, um, I think what we'll do, we're, we're going to start with, you know, what is ALS and how is it diagnosed and treated currently? Okay, for sure. ALS, a lot of long words, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And it's actually a, a disease that's been known about for a very long time. It goes back to Charcot. In fact, in some parts of the world, it is known as Charcot's disease. The French neurologist uh, in the 1800s first described uh, the condition. In the United States, we often call it Lou Gehrig's disease. It's probably uh, more commonly used. We're just ALS, and there is an ALS association, just like there's a Parkinson's association or an MS society. So it is a tragic disorder. It fortunately affects far fewer people than diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and MS. Yet it does affect many of us, unfortunately, and uh, there have been many prominent individuals who have passed away from the disease, besides Lou Gehrig, of course. Uh, people like, uh, I love jazz, so the famous bassist Charles Mingus died of ALS. Uh, we have people... Uh, for example, um, Sam Shepard, the playwright and actor, not too long ago, died of ALS. So it's around, uh, I think, something like 15,000 cases in the United States at any given moment in time. But it's a disease that's uh, characterized by weakness. Weakness is the prominent symptom of ALS. And it's a weakness that is driven not only by the signals coming from the brain that travel down through the spinal cord, but by the signals that are leaving the spinal cord going out to the, the arms and the legs. Uh, we, we actually call that upper and lower motor neuron disease. Got it. And what else? So, I mean, it's a progressive condition. Um, What's the timeline? We were talking a little bit before we got on the podcast around, you know, um, what are we doing in an inter what's our goal with integrative medicine? What, be what benefits, what's, what have you seen with improvements of quality of life? Uh, you know, of course, you know, in integrative functional medicine, we kind of get, um, you know, we'll see spontaneous remissions that we can't claim cure because we've got an N of one. Um, however, you know, I would like to think, by improving the vitality of the individual, we're stimulating the innate healing ability of the body and we're influencing some beneficial outcomes, yeah? I, I would 100% agree. So we do have to understand the disease first and what's going on. It can be very rapidly progressive in some individuals. There are individuals who 
don't survive beyond the first couple of years after the diagnosis, that's not terribly uncommon. Uh, the mortality at five years is quite high. Few people live beyond five years with the disease. So it's definitely something that we want to catch early. The person is starting to develop weakness, loss of muscle mass, possibly spasms, what we actually call spasticity, maybe even some changes in personality or mood or memory because some people with ALS can have changes in their brain in the frontal lobe and temporal lobe areas that uh, go along with the weakness that they have. So if a person is developing a progressive weakness, this is the time to definitely not only see your regular medical doctor and find out why, but consider seeing a functional medicine doctor who can help you address those root causes. Very simple answer to your question though, is if we look at one of the treatments that is approved, there are very few approved treatments for this condition, really only uh, two right now in the United States are FDA approved. One of them is basically an antioxidant. And as a naturopathic doctor, we probably talk a lot about this thing called oxidative stress. So it isn't the only mechanism at work in this disease, but it is important to realize that we are treating disease, the disease with an FDA approved drug that's basically a fancy antioxidant. So we're getting at a mechanism that's very familiar to most of us. Interesting, what other underlying causes do you see in your practice or what's your th current thought process around ALS as far as other things that contribute into its development. Yeah, so let me, if I may, just give a little bit of a backstory. I've spent the last couple of years unraveling things like multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, we're talking about that in the summit, of course, and there's been very good work by other people like Dale Bredesen, Terry Walls, other people like David Perlmutter, who talk a lot about all of these conditions. And, you know, it's, it occurred to me, and I, I have a lot of people with ALS come and work with me uh, through my functional medicine program called Brain Tune-Up, that the principles that we use to treat conditions like MS or Alzheimer's should be applicable to ALS. It seems like far less is known about ALS. I've spent a lot of time digging through the literature, and make no mistake about it, there is a large amount of literature but really deeply understanding this condition from a root cause level still is a little bit of a mystery. There's, there's a lot of puzzle pieces. It's almost like you know going to the store and buying that thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and then just dumping the pieces on the table. It's like, oh gosh, I know all the pieces are there, but it's gonna take a lot of work to put all these pieces together. And that's been a project of mine over this past year to really start to deeply understand this condition and what are the main mechanisms involved and where can we make a difference as functional medicine practitioner, practitioners. And what's interesting to me, among other things, is that one of the first uh, most recent uh, set of articles that I've been exploring, besides this uh, familiar term oxidative stress, and you'll know this other term right away, is inflammation. It turns out that inflammation or what we call neuroinflammation plays a key role as we work down the functional medicine tree. It's an image that's used a lot by functional medicine practitioners from those distant branches that are really the names of these diseases toward the trunk to understand the, the, the main driving factors then ultimately what's down in that terrain and the soil and the roots, those root causes. So it turns out that inflammation does appear to play a key role in this disorder. And so if we can then understand our patients in terms of things that are driving inflammation for them, it appears that we can make a difference with their condition. Interesting. So what um, in your program, your brain tune up, you apply that in with all neurodegeneration because it's that, that kind of tree analogy of going down. So on the root causes or what do you see as main contributory factors or, um, you know, I think levels of toxicity we've seen in the research. Um, what else, what are you seeing? Right. So, you know, I, I decided I, I, I was a board, I am a board certified neurologist, but I decided 
that I would limit my practice to neurology. I think it's a really important message as we get into this ALS discussion, because I think, you know, if we look at conventional medicine in general, most of society has accepted the fact that if you have a heart attack, just as an example, that part of your recovery from a heart attack is what we call rehabilitation, cardio rehab. So what does that involve? It involves diet, right? Your cardiologist and is gonna work with you on your diet, exercise, maybe some fish oil, right? Some, gosh, that starts to sound like functional medicine. And, <laughs> and, and we kind of understand that when it comes to the heart, but it's really important to say, hey, the brain is absolutely no different. So my message is that whether we're dealing with ALS, whether we're dealing with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, whether we're dealing with migraine or seizures, we have to fundamentally be thinking about the same types of strategies. Identify the things that drive inflammation, identify the things that drive oxidative stress, understand that person as a unique individual, what are the factors that make them different from the next person, even if they have the exact same diagnosis. So we're working with the person more than we're actually working with the diagnosis. But the really important message, of course, is that if you have a diagnosis like ALS, you can get help. And so we've helped quite a few people through our five pillar process in our clinic to ultimately get some control over their ALS. I mean, I think you said something really important in the beginning is there's such a terrible diagnosis that when you hear those words, it's, it, you know, the next uh, temptation is to sort of give it up, throw in the towel. We treated a patient, for example, very early on in my functional medicine program, who is a public individual, uh, very uh, public about his diagnosis of ALS, in fact, has a, a foundation uh, to raise money for ALS research. And he had the means to travel anywhere in the country, really anywhere in the world to get care. And he did. So he would go to the Mayo Clinic and he'd go to Massachusetts General Harvard and he'd go out to Johns Hopkins University. And he said, you know, these are wonderful institutions. They are absolutely first class. But the thing about them when I go there is they basically, they want to test my strength. They have me do something called the ALS functional rating scale. And what they're basically doing is they're connecting the dots over time and they're plotting my downhill course. They want to know, you know, are you worse? Are you worse? Are you worse? You know, that's what, that's what the visits are all, are all about. Are you worse today? So what we want to do is we don't want to dismiss any of the importance of all that. These are very important doctors and researchers in the, in the hospital systems. But we want to say, look, it is important to track this disease. Tracking is key, but tracking can also be about where can you make improvements? Where can you make changes? So one example that we can talk about is diet. You know, this is a very fundamental thing. It's very kind of grassroots fun, uh, functional medicine concept, food. But it turns out that it's actually a really interesting subject when it comes to ALS. Um, one thing that, that, that those who are listening to this podcast may find interesting is, you know, we're, right now we're in this sort of craze over going keto. Everybody should be on the ketogenic diet. Well, what is the ketogenic diet? The ketogenic diet is, of course, it's a high fat diet and all that stuff, but it's a diet that really tricks our body into thinking it's starving, right? And the thing about people with ALS is that the tissues affected in ALS are very, very high energy demand. So one of the things that appears to be the case is that if you take somebody with ALS and you do not give them enough energy. I know we don't often like to talk about calories and we'd rather talk about nutrient density, but if you don't give them enough energy, if you don't give them enough calories and nutrients, they will actually get much worse very quickly. So things like a ketogenic diet may not be such a good idea for someone with ALS. Now it doesn't mean go out and eat a bunch of junk food and sugar, because that's obviously very inflammatory as well. So in our clinic, what we do is we actually really watch carefully on that nutrient density part, but the amount of food, the energy density of the food 
not just because fat happens to be a very energy dense macronutrient, but actually eating enough. I don't know if you've seen this. I have folks that come in all, all the time and it's not, there's nothing wrong inherently with their choices of food per se, but they're just not eating enough. Like, yeah. dude, you got to eat more. If you want to make yourself healthy, this is not the time to starve yourself. So it's a very critical take home message, especially for those who do a lot of self care. You know, we're, we have this podcast here, there are blogs out there. A lot of folks who want to get on the internet, see what they can find out, see if they can, you know, take a few supplements and do some things on their own. But what I'm saying here is when it comes to diet, we have to be very, very careful because that can be a really important point for some of I, I love you stressing that, you know, food is our best medicine and it is crucial, right? I, I mean, I kind of call ketogenic diet the flavor of the month, right? I used mm -hmm. to work at, I'm a librarian, I love, you know, undergraduate and in graduate school and the medical school, I worked in the library and you go and you look at how many different diet books there have been through time, right? Uh, it's amazing. Everybody's got a different take on it. Um, you know, yes, ketogenic can be very powerful if implemented properly. And uh, it's not a be all end all diet. And I am with you, Dr. Charlin, I see so many folks that come in with with basic nutritional deficiencies. And if you don't have the basics met, it doesn't matter what kind of fancy protocol we put on top of that, you're just not going to get any propulsion going in any direction, right? Um, so that, I thank you for stressing that because, you know, food is our best medicine. Um, as the listeners of What the Health know, I'm very passionate about that. Uh, you know, all new patients get a diet diary. I say, I, I'm not a judgmental being. I'm one of the least judgmental beings on the planet. So be brutally honest on that thing. Um, so definitely, you know, if you're watching this and you have ALS or other concerns of neurodegeneration or even on your brain health, you know, please know it, it sounds very simple, like, oh, I'm just going to change my diet, but it can have some profound impacts on, on your well-being. That's right. It turns out that people who are underweight with this disease tend to have a worse prognosis. So you actually need to really maintain that weight. Doesn't mean be obese, but you've got to maintain that weight, which in part is getting those nutrients down. I became interested in this, in, in this story of ALS through the work of a, I say a well-known research doctor. You may or may not be aware of him. He's about a generation or two before us, but his name is Roy Walford. Uh, a lot of folks uh, who are following the type of information that you share in your, in your podcast and, and our colleagues probably have heard of something called the Prolon diet, the fasting mimicking diet. Dr. Walter Longo is at University of Southern California. Well, Dr. Longo was actually a pro or is a protege of Roy Walford. And Roy Walford's story is absolutely fascinating. And if I had been around, I mean, I'm in my mid fifties, but if, if I had doing, been doing what we do now, say in the 80s and 90s, Roy Walford would have been king. So he actually wrote a book called The 120-Year Diet. He was a pathologist and a major he, uh, researcher in the area of aging and understanding the underlying biological mechanisms of aging. He was at uh, University of Southern California. And Roy Walford was one of these very... Uh, colorful characters. He was on all the talk shows and the radio shows. You know, they didn't podcast at that point in time, but you know, Larry King Live, that kind of thing. He was famous for his calorie restricted, nutrient dense diet that he was convinced was going to allow him to live to 120 years or longer, potentially. And it is, in fact, true that it, that across many many species. If you restrict calorie intake, but maintain nutrient density that whether it's fruit flies or whether it's mice or whether it's rhesus monkeys, they do actually live longer. And, and some of the biomarkers that tell us that this type of approach works are also true in humans, which is really why the prolonged diet is important why Dr. Longo's work is important beyond the commercialization of that diet. Well, Walford 
at one point in time had an opportunity to join a team of what they called Terranauts, okay? Hmm. Uh, these were seven or eight scientists who agreed to enter a structure that's located in the Arizona desert called the biosphere, or biosphere two. This is a completely enclosed system. I definitely encourage folks to look it up. It's sort of very Star Trek-ish, if you will. It's very sci-fi. And they even had their jumpsuits, like they're going to outer space, you know, and they, they didn't have short of helmets. They definitely look like astronauts. And they, they agreed to enter this structure for a period of two years. And it was a completely enclosed structure. The idea was that they would create these ecosystems within this structure. And they, even, they would have like a rainforest and a desert and, you know, and all that kind of thing. And they had farm, farm animals and grew their own food. And, and it was supposed to be completely you know, self-serving. Closed, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this would be what maybe if we colonized Mars or something like that, right, that we would create. And that's how we would live on Mars. Well, it turned out that there were a lot of problems within this biosphere. Now, remember that, that Walford was already a pretty thin guy because he was practicing what he preached and he was already calorie restricting. But he went into this uh, this biosphere and they quickly realized that they were not going to be able to produce as much food as they thought they were going to be able to produce. So all of them had, were forced into this calorie restricted diet for an extended period of time. And even though he was very thin, he got a lot thinner in there. And then some other things happened. For example, uh, you know, we know that trees take in the carbon dioxide, of course, and they put out oxygen and we in turn take in oxygen put out carbon dioxide so this is that symbiotic relationship with plant life that we have well there were problems within the biosphere where certain levels of gases built up and this included nitric oxide levels it got very high carbon dioxide levels got very high in fact at one point they sort of had to cheat by pumping oxygen into the biosphere because levels got so low well, Walford, during his time in there, started to display some unusual behavior and it almost looked like he was drunk the way he was walking. And when he left the biosphere, it didn't really improve. And at first I thought, well, it's, maybe he's, he's got, had some back problems. Maybe it was his back. He had back surgery. Yeah, the pain improved, but his walking continued to get worse. And he started to look like somebody who had actually had Parkinson's disease. Well, it took several years from the time he left the biosphere till the time that his diagnosis of ALS was made. But in fact, Ward Walford did have ALS and he died a few years later at, at about 79 years old. So here is a man who, you know, researched aging, practiced this calorie restricted diet, did some, he's truly amazing, a hero to a lot of people and, and for good reason and yet contracted this disease, this terrible disease, and didn't even come close to 120 years. So that story really fascinated me, and I, I wanted to know more about it. I wanted to see if I could unravel some of the reasons why Walford may have developed ALS. Hmm. So, you know, breaking it down, of course, none of the other Terranauts developed ALS. So we know that there's some genetic predisposition, but most cases of ALS are considered spontaneous. So it's by far not solely a genetic disorder. But gene genes probably play a role. Don't we say that uh, the, the genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger? Pulls the trigger, yeah. Right? yeah. So important to realize that. Now, decreased calorie intake, could that have played a role? Possibly so, possibly. I have a, another patient I saw in my clinic who became symptomatic. I'm not saying it's caused as ALS, but became symptomatic immediately after finishing an extended water fast. Hmm. So I actually think that possibly plays a role. Now, what about these toxic gases that built up in the biosphere? Could they have played a role? Well, there is some evidence that nitrous oxide may play an important role in uh, triggering oxidative stress inside the cells and promoting this disease. So there is that theory uh, of ALS. Uh, 
Could other factors, could stress play a role? Certainly it was a very stressful environment within there. We do know that aside from all of Walford's story, that for example, uh, people who are more likely to develop ALS have had some head injuries, particularly soccer players, uh, soldiers involved in combat blast injury type of uh, victims. Uh, they are at increased risk of developing ALS. So there are, in fact, things that we can identify and we can use Walford's story as a case example of can we understand what happened to him so we can understand more deeply how we can approach the problem. But again, circling back around, it can come down to understanding the things that drive inflammation, understanding the things that drive oxidative stress. So what else besides uh, food, right? What do, you, what do you look for in your patients? Do we? Oh, well, for all chronic neurodegeneration, heavy metals, yeah. you know, yes. um, they, we're storing them in our fat. Uh, it's a known trigger for a lot of oxidative stress and inflammation. And I just find if they're there, you got to deal with that because it'll, it's a showstopper for everything else. Yes. Right? Heavy metals and chemicals in the environment, probably huge, neuro, you know, huge neurotoxins, no question about it. So we have to address detoxification. We do have to look for chronic infections that may play a role. You know, we still have to look at uh, the, the other biotoxins like mold or Lyme, you know, Lyme disease. That can mimic a lot of these symptoms, right? Absolutely. So do you have, a, you have a workup before people come out to your clinic? Are you working them up or how are you doing that? So because I'm a neurologist, if the diagnosis has not been made, if somebody's coming to me because of progressive weakness, we're going to figure out what's going on first. And I may be the one that ultimately bears the bad news to yeah. the patient, but I can do all that basic workup. A lot of people who come to me for functional medicine already have that diagnosis and they're looking for solutions to the problem because their regular medical doctor sort of tells them, well, there's yeah. nothing I can do. Sorry. Can right. Yeah. So, but that's it. So we put them through this program. We do investigate heavy metals. We do investigate things like mold and toxins. We look into other things like hormone levels, nutrient balances we've talked about. That's very key. We get a good, just a good history of things like sleep. How are you doing with sleep? You know, how many folks say, well, my food is dialed in. They say, how do you sleep? Oh, terrible. Can't yeah. sleep. Well, that's not going to, you know, allow for healing if we can't get sleep taken care right. of. We still have to work on that stress resilience piece. We have to make sure, you know, these chronic diseases, the, these are diseases that are capable of producing a tremendous amount of loneliness. And it's a very counterproductive uh, way to exist because you do need that support system and you do need a sense of purpose when dealing with these illnesses. So we really want to talk to our patients also about their connection with others. Who's their support system? Who are they working with? And how are they framing their life at this point moving forward? Because you know, we're trying to improve quality of life. We are trying to extend life with quality of life, but we're not saying at this point we've found the cure to ALS. So our patients do appear to be living longer. They do appear to be more stable, if you will. That's good. But I believe it's because we've addressed that whole person and includes that mind-body connection as well. What are you finding like biggest levers to push on for your patients? Have you found certain things to be, is there any trend or any similarity? I mean, I know it's vastly different for everybody that comes in and you know, you're seeing enough folks to say, well, maybe there is a little bit like I'm seeing more in the metals camp or more with, you know, their stool analysis was uh, whacked is the technical term that we use here. Uh, so, um, you know, along those lines, are you seeing any trends or any uh, themes that are emerging? 
I, I can't say that I, I really am seeing specific themes in the sense that everyone truly is unique. So the way our program works, and we do, don't do a huge number of stool studies, I'll do them occasionally, but I have a very comprehensive panel of labs, primarily in, involves blood, a little bit of saliva as well. And so everybody is put through that same panel of tests, but everyone also meets with myself as well as my dietitian, my movement person, my my health coach who does a lot of kind of mind body type work because we need to evaluate each piece of that puzzle for each different person. So we absolutely check for all of those things. But again, I can't say that I have necessarily lumped them together in such a way that I can extract data and say, well, here's the trend and here's the trend. Sure. Got it. You know, how, what about, there is some promising research coming out of Israel on regenerative stem cell therapies. Yeah, isn't, don't they have a third phase trial going on over there? Yeah, well, actually it's in the, so the company, as I understand it, is called Brainstorm Cell Therapeutics and is based out of Israel or that, you know, that's where the original research was done. But their, their work is being done in the United States now. Uh, oh, they are in phase three for, ALS. Uh, they uh, published a letter not too long ago that, that basically said they had entered into discussion with the FDA for an approval track following the completion of their, uh, their phase three trial. So they are actually doing this work in the United States. They put a, a bunch of Novartis uh, pharmaceutical uh, administrators, executives on their board of directors or medical director uh, brought out the drug fingolimod, which is used multiple sclerosis. So they have folks that understand the regulatory system and know how to bring treatments out to the market in the conventional space. Mm. But yes, what this is, and again, I think this is where we're kind of going with ALS. We uh, ultimately have to create that, that foundation for these treatments to work. The basic lifestyle stuff, the removing the toxins, you know, et cetera, et cetera, treating the infections, but then we have to regenerate. And so what this trial specifically does is that uh, patients are having their bone marrow uh, aspirated. Uh, I don't know the exact volume is very common to remove around 60 cc's of bone marrow, but it may, the protocol may be different for these, this particular study. Now, what they are doing, which makes their treatment pro proprietary, is they are manipulating the stem cells that are in this bone marrow to express what they call neural elements. So to sort of behave or look like or signal, if you will, tissue within the nervous system specifically. As we would say that these, these cells that are extracted are pluripotent. They have the potential to divide and become a variety of other specific types of tissue in the body what they want to do is manipulate this tissue in such a way that it's more nervous system specific. So what they do then is once they've extracted this bone marrow, they manipulate the cells, they then reinfuse the stem cells into the subject with ALS. They've been injecting muscle because they have to get to peripheral nerves somehow. And then they also put stem cells into the spinal fluid. We use the term intrathecal, and then measure outcomes. So there have been some exciting results with this trial so far. It doesn't, again, not appear to be a cure, but these stem cells have very two primary, very potent effects. Number one is, guess what? They're anti-inflammatory. So there's that inflammation again. But they also secrete uh, uh, messages to surrounding tissues that are growth and repair messages, you know, growth factors, et cetera. And so it's that combination of controlling inflammation, but signaling growth and repair at the same time that appears to confer some degree of effect on those with ALS. Not surprisingly, this type of treatment appears to be beneficial with other chronic neurological diseases like Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. This very same company has other disease process trials using the exact same technology. Cool. Oh, do you know, are they recruiting in the United States for that study or is that done? 
I think they are still recruiting. I have had a couple of patients attempt to get into the trial. I think the, if you will, admission process is extremely rigorous. It is very understandable that the yeah. demand is huge to get yeah. into this trial. But bear in mind too, that this is a clinical trial. And I always, we do clinical trials in our office. Now we don't, we're not doing this trial to be clear, yeah. but that clinical trials are really done for the greater good of society because they're, they're gonna have some kind of control that may be a placebo control. And I think it is in the case of this particular study, or it may be what they call active control where there's some other drug that's an established approved drug that the new drug or treatment is being compared to. So when you go into these trials, you don't really know what you're getting. You don't know right. if you're getting the active treatment. Now it turns out that in South Korea, there's a company, I think it's called CoreStem, but I may be mistaken. Uh, I believe it's CoreStem that actually has very similar technology. And in the South Korean version of the FDA, this treatment is actually approved in that country. Hmm. If you wanted to, I guess you could go to South Korea and find yourself a doctor and check it out else yeah. for, your, for your ALS. But um, I think that it's coming and I think what we have to offer, uh, Dr. Eckel, is that we bring something to the table that's equally valuable. And I really, really believe that functional medicine marries itself so well to these regenerative medicine approaches because you can't take an inflamed vessel, if you will, and expect that you're going to control inflammation with stem cells until you've kind of cleaned up the picture, right? You have yeah. to get the body ready. So I think functional medicine practitioners and regenerative medicine practitioners complement one, what complement each other extremely well. And what we hope to offer in Ozark very soon is at least the opportunity to harvest stem cells from bone marrow in patients who are interested and allow them to receive back their own stem cells into the spinal fluid or in, into the bloodstream intravenously and treat them. Now we can't legally manipulate those stem cells, but we think that in the understanding that what we're treating is inflammation and that these are not yet proven treatments in the United States, that we'll have an opportunity to help folks with ALS who'd want to venture into that realm with their condition and offer that in addition to functional medicine. Lovely. That's an awesome offering. I'm excited for your clinic to have that up and running because that is, uh, you know, I do think that is really where we need to go for these conditions. There's been really no big breakthroughs and uh, it is very promising. Of course, we need more research and a lot of these folks with ALS, like you're saying, you know, the lifespan is, the stats are dismal. Uh, they don't have the time to wait for a lot of this stuff to come in, right? Mm. Um, you know, I guess on that, what on innovative treatments, right? I mean, we do talk, and I do want to stress, like the foundational work is very powerful, right? That lifestyle stuff of putting that in, you're right. If the vessel is totally inflamed, it doesn't matter what kind of fancy therapy we put on top of that. It's just not going to be well received. So, you know, for our listeners, I just want to stress, like there are a lot of steps that Dr. Charlin is sharing here that you can implement and put into play and practice, um, you know, in particular looking at inflammation, what, what are you measuring? What do you, what do you see really contributes into that inflammatory component? So we talked about diet, you're doing some dietary testing with folks and nutritional assays. Is that, did I pick that up right? Right, we measure for a number of different micronutrients. And of course yeah. we take a thorough dietary history and do a nutritional physical examination. So it's very Perfect. key. And yeah. I, you know, I, maybe, uh, maybe I make functional medicine just sound too simple, but I, I really oh. believe that those lifestyle factors absolutely are the foundation. So we have to work on sleep, we have to work on movement, we have to work on stress, we have to work on food, we have to work on connection. Because there are all these treatments, you know, and you may do some of them, you know, what about hyperbaric oxygen, right? Great treatment, support your mitochondria. Maybe you want to do some uh, sauna detox, near infrared, far infrared, if you like that, you know, all that stuff, that's really important. But would you tell somebody, hey, you know, we don't have to worry about diet. We don't have to worry about all these other things. We'll just put you in the hyperbarics and we're good, right? Yeah. 
Or are you going to give somebody a IV glutathione for a while, really support their mitochondria, support detoxification? Well, it does all that stuff. It's great. It's a great treatment. But again, if we're not addressing why that became a problem in the first place, then given all the IV glutathione in the world, it's not going to make that much of a difference. So there are these more advanced treatments, you know, NAD, that kind of thing. They all have a really important place. But I think, you know, this is a word I made up, but I always say that we have to be very careful about what I call allopathicizing functional medicine. Like there's some kind of treatment as if it's a pill, an infusion, a gadget. No, that's not really what functional medicine is all about. It is a holistic perspective that understands the person with the condition. And really, we are inflammologists, if you will. So we understand all those things that drive inflammation, and we understand human beings. The difference between us and our traditional allopathic colleagues is once they've made that diagnosis, their treatment is focused on the diagnosis. They've forgotten about the person entirely, right? That's not how functional medicine works, and that's what makes us unique, and I think that's what makes what we do very powerful. Oh, I, I totally agree. That term that I use for that is green allopathy. So, you know, instead of the drug, well, here's the natural product. You know, we're treating symptoms. So I, I really like that emphasis on treating whole dynamic heart-centered beings is the other thing that I say about that is like, we treat people, right? Not disease processes. And that is very powerful because that, in actuality, that's why you are seeing difficult recalcitrant conditions in your clinic and why we see them out at Nature Cares as well is that, you know, people are literally dying for this medicine. And, you know, because we are addressing all of the facets of care and that helps move the needle at a much greater rate rather than just suppressing a symptom. And, you know, that, that aspect on um, kind of coming back to, okay, that you do the nutritional component and then you do a full array, um, you are collecting that data across the board. Are you just, just out of curiosity, my, my interest, are you just keeping that in an Excel spreadsheet or how are you accessing the data that you're collecting? Do you do that well, through your EMR or what are you doing there? We do. And, you know, I have all kinds of ideas about things that will happen in the future in our clinic because we do have this research component of, of our clinic. But right now, for example, we're using Quest Diagnostics, very, very large lab company, of course, mm -hmm. um, in the, probably maybe the biggest, I think it's bigger than LabCorp. And so we have a phlebotomist in our office, we draw blood, we, we're connected to their system. Uh, the results come to us, they get ported into our electronic health record. Um, I wish I could say that it, it, it populates the health, electronic health record in the manner that like, a, like an uh, Excel spreadsheet, but really it just kind of looks like a standard lab printout. We need to get to the point where it does populate those databases or those spreadsheets because then we can extract numbers, we can do all kinds of statistical analyses on them. What yeah. we have done is we've started to develop, um, and this does sound very allopathic, but for good reason, we've started to develop disease specific templates for our patients so that if you have ALS, for example, when you come in, there's certain standard things that we're gonna check, right? So that everyone with ALS has an ALS functional rating scale. Everyone with ALS has a force, what's called a forced vital capacity. If you have multiple sclerosis, you do what's called a 25 time 25 foot walk. You do a peg hold test. You do a fatigue rating scale. So, because these are the standard things that are always checked in research studies when you have multiple sclerosis when you're studying MS. So once we start to apply those individual templates to, you know, people who have these conditions, then we'll have a way to extract out data from our, you know, from our uh, database and say, hey, you know, if we use these functional medicine principles, so now we're back to the whole patient, we see improvements in the 25 foot walk. We see improvements in the nine uh, peg hole in the peg hole test. We see improvements in fatigue, which Terry Walls has shown from the very beginning with her work. Right with ALS, we see an ALS functional rating scale that either gets better or stabilizes and doesn't follow that expected trajectory, which is very fast. I mean, one I. 
there's no advantage to having ALS, but the point I want to make is that because it tends to be a rapidly progressive disease, if someone's still doing well two, three, four years out, you've got to believe if you see that time and time again that you're making a difference for people with this disease. You know, with Alzheimer's, it's a much more, you know, slowly progressive indolent disorder. And so it's a lot, you need a lot more time to study Alzheimer's in its natural state. But ALS, unfortunately, goes very quickly. And so I think we can really get a handle on are people doing better? And I think they are. Lovely. I love that. And you have, so when people come out to your clinic, then do you monitor, do telemedicine uh, to checkups or how, how do you manage folks? Yeah, so we do both. Uh, we see them in clinic and we do telemedicine as well. I'm a, you know, I'm a traditional doc and, you know, one of the first things I learned about doctors is the laying on of hands. You know, I really believe that touching the patient, being in the same room, you know, it's almost like if you talked about heart math with your listeners, with your patients, you know, we have that energy that we connect heart to heart. And, and I, I think that's, that can happen via telemedicine, but I don't think it happens as readily as if it happens in the room. So, though, we are in a new age in the United States, and I know we promised we wouldn't talk too much about it, and I won't, but in this age of the coronavirus 19, things are changing for all of us. Uh, it's interesting that the federal government has loosened their guidelines to allow providers to contact people across state lines into states where they are not licensed, so you're in Washington, are you in Washington Oregon. State? Oregon. Oregon. In Oregon, well, I'm not licensed in Oregon. And if my initial encounter with you in Oregon was via telemedicine, I would have to be licensed there, you know, before pre-COVID, if you will, right. to be able to take care of you. That's probably not going to be the case moving forward. So we are now positioning ourselves to do more telemedicine than we've done before. We know that there are a lot of folks who want help and we've always asked that people come to our clinic in Ozark and I still ask that they do, but I understand if they don't. And as long as we've communicated those limitations, what's possible over telemedicine, we're more willing than ever to help them out. So the folks with ALS, that's a really tough disease to have and to travel with. And right. now we can help them by telemedicine. Yeah, and that I think one of the I guess we can we can let it out of the bag here. We we did really well for fifty minutes, so thank you for that limiting our discussion on COVID. Um, but I do think that's one of the big pluses of what's going on now because I'm speaking to people all over the country and they are overwhelmed and alone with these diagnoses that they just don't have adequate care in wherever they're living, you know, and to have specialists in in their condition that can offer some new routes and avenues to go that could be a, a tremendous game changer for them. This really opens that possibility up to them a lot more, you know, for qualified licensed professionals to actually be able to help them, you know? 100%. And you know, you and I were talking about, there are a lot of folks getting on social media and so forth and doing their COVID thing. And that's fine. That's awesome that they're doing it. You know, I'm a neurologist, so I really can't speak at a, in a position of authority about this infection, this viral infection. But what I can speak about is, for example, if you have multiple sclerosis and you take medicine for that disease, do you have an extra you know, level of concern, right? Do you, what do you need to know in this COVID environment if you have MS? What do you need to know in this COVID environment if you have Alzheimer's disease? A quick example, one of the most destructive, um, I don't know what the word is, just disturbing things you can do to somebody who has Alzheimer's is put them in an unfamiliar environment, right? Is they get, ex they get extremely agitated and extremely disoriented. Well, what are we doing in this COVID situation is we're saying social isolation. So now you take these folks who are increasingly sort of disconnected from the point of view of their degenerative disorder and they're, you know, they don't always know where they are or recognize people around them. And you really change everything by completely isolating them. And we've got a real big problem on our hands. 
So I think for me as an expert in neurology, it's no, I'm not, a, I'm not an infectious diseases expert, but what I can talk a little bit about is understanding these neurological conditions in the context of this, in this pandemic that we're experiencing and guiding folks, whether they have MS, whether they have Alzheimer's or ALS, you know, the ALS folks, they have compromised breathing very often. So they really need to be aware that they are at especially high risk with this virus, right? So we need to take extra care with those folks, just as an example. For sure. Well, coming down to the last final two here, uh, any last parting words or information that you would like to get out there? I just want to go back to the point that I made in the very beginning, that the brain and the heart share that commonality that these concepts that, that the general public is familiar with apply equally to the brain. And ALS is, is one of those conditions of many. I happen to be very interested in helping people with ALS, and it's something I've been spending this past year really, really dialing, really focusing in on, and I'll be traveling around the country this year, speaking in different on different stages about ALS and Dr. Walford's story and so forth. But we can go outside of ALS, talk about MS, Alzheimer's, et cetera. The really important thing to know is if you have one of these disorders, there is hope, there is help, there are things that you can do. No one has just signed your death certificate. Don't accept that as an answer. Don't accept that as your trajectory. As long as you know there are people like yourself myself that are out there helping folks, please connect with one of us because we do get results. Our patients are so grateful and you know we want to just help even more. Awesome. Well, th thank you so much for coming on. What the health? Everybody out there listening, please share the share the story, share the show. Write reviews if you like what you're hearing. I'm trying to bring you the best and the brightest out there in the integrative functional space, and we want to be your authority. You know, I'm bringing in really heart-centered practitioners that are in the trenches. Like, this is the clinician's clinician show, and, you know, Dr. Charlin is uh, one of those leaders in the functional neurologist realm out here in the United States, so I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your, your information with our listeners. Thank you so much for having me. Tuning in to What the Health Tuesdays from 2 to 3 Pacific Coast time and also found on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Tune back in next week, folks. Great seeing you.